Hello. So a few months ago, my partner and I moved from Australia to Costa Rica with the intention of giving birth to our child so that not only do they get an extra passport, but we also have as parents a permanent residency and a pathway to citizenship. Ultimately setting our family up with another base in another part of the world. And yeah, now our son has been born uh, just a little over a week ago. <laughs> he is still yet to be named and I thought the best way to answer all these questions and really tell my story um, would be here on YouTube in longer form. So this is probably going to be a two-part video because there is such a distinct difference between that transition from maiden to mother. So in this video, I'm going to be covering my preconception, my pregnancy journey, and then in part two, I will go a little bit more into depth and <laughs> tell my story of my labor and my birth. Prior to falling pregnant, my content was really centered around health, wellness, freedom, sovereignty, and there was a bit of satire and foot archery in between. But as soon as I fell pregnant, I really hyper fixated on birth because it was a topic that I hadn't really looked into beforehand and I didn't want to walk blindly into that situation. And the more I learned about birth and how it has truly been <laughs> manipulated and overrun and turned into an industry rather than a, a sacred initiation, I was just blown away by learning so much information. But yeah, now that we have had this uh, process, <laughs> I am looking forward to returning back to those topics a little bit more because they are things that I really am passionate about. And I built my audience uh, up with these topics in mind, not just the pregnancy content. So this video I think is going to act as a really nice tie, uh, not of loose ends, but like a bit of closure after a long journey. Now I feel like I can return to a bit more of my old self and explore more of my new self as I navigate this journey. So I will begin with a preconception and the preparation that I did. I've had so many questions about who is the father, you know, what kind of supplements are you taking, was this planned, all of those very intimate questions. <laughs> I'll first begin with my story of birth control. I had the implanon put into my arm when I was uh, 18 and I was having really painful periods, irregular cycles. You know, I was experiencing acne for the first time in my life. And when I had that birth control put into my arm, it temporarily fixed things. Two and a half years later, I decided to remove it <laughs> and those same symptoms came back. So there was definitely a very long process of healing my body and having my hormones regulate and coming back into a state of homeostasis, which I believe took, you know, at least a year. So preconception prep consisted of getting off birth control, really switching up my diet. There was an emotional process, which I'll get into a little bit more. And one of the other major things that I did to prepare for my pregnancy was switching from a vegan diet to a bit more animal based, a bit more Western price style. So when I got a birth control and I was going through that process of trying to regulate my hormones and come back into balance and come back into alignment, I was really focusing on sourcing high quality organic products, reducing the pesticides and the agrochemicals that I was consuming, building and re-establishing a connection with the food and with the farmers that were growing my food and, and within those communities. We went maybe nine months of eating this way and really prioritizing sourcing those nutritious foods and building up our stores. As well as eating organic, I also decided to, you know, go through that process of storing synthetic clothing, readdressing what I was spraying on my body, what chemicals I was using, filtering the waters that not only we're drinking, but we're showering with, and all of the little things really do add up. That was a form of detoxing that I think my body did and what felt intuitively right in the moment to prepare for this pregnancy. About three months before we conceived our child as well, a lot of emotional stuff was, was coming up. You know, I really advocate on my platforms, which is a little bit controversial, but to not have intimacy with people that you wouldn't have a child with. A lot of that stuff is really coming to the surface again. You know, is this the partner that you see yourself building a family with? Is this um, the path that you want to take? Do you value family are you ready for that commitment and just like addressing these these things ultimately I was uh, actioning towards this um, my subconscious was just trying to 
you know, make sure that I, it was what I wanted and, and it was. And then to speak more into a little bit of the, the woo-woo, we saw an astrologist who read our birth chart and she mentioned around this timeline, you know, uh, we were still in <laughs> the pandemic phase when we visited her, so very much homebodies and staying at home and going internal and having our little routines. And, and she mentioned, <laughs> I see family, I see children and I see travel for you in your future very soon. So if that's not something that you want, you know, be very mindful. I don't think that I could have exercised any more free will and had this um, not happen. And I'll just mention this as well because it was pretty significant in the moment. I sat in ceremony a few months beforehand and I saw myself within my mother's womb as a child. Then it took me to another experience where I felt uh, the energy of a son, the energy of a, a boy within my womb and I kind of knew that that was calling in or like prophesizing something that would happen and within that ceremony I also sat with my boyfriend at the time, his cousin and his auntie and I felt the thread of connection <laughs> between blood at times uh, within the room and, and the essence of family and, and what was coming. So I did have an idea in, in some degree. <laughs> Flashing forward, I find out that I'm pregnant at uh, maybe four weeks, so that was quite early. And as soon as I found out, I had this massive automatic response of just uh, tears and like heartbreak. And a lot of people don't speak about this because although it was something that I wanted, I really believe that it was this death of the maiden, like mourning her past self and, and I, don't even think that I could control it but I think that was a, a perfectly natural response to the situation despite um, wanting it and calling it in and preparing for it so if you do find out that you're pregnant and you experience that no, I believe that it's normal and maybe it is quite common we plan to do a home birth in Australia at the time we were living on a little island just off the coast as soon as I found out I'm pregnant I began looking for a pro-choice midwife which was actually really challenging because a lot of the midwives lost their licenses after the pandemic because they chose not to be vaccinated and that was just something that we wanted if, if I was going to allow someone very intimately into my life and into my transition I wanted somebody who had the same kind of values so I really wanted to connect with this person another problem with midwives that you hire that are within the system is that in order to keep their licensing they need to abide by certain rules and regulations so you know they can't actually pursue a home birth and will drop you as a client if you are before 37 weeks or go past 42 weeks which can actually be really normal you know to have a birth at 42 weeks in a day or two days I didn't want that pressure additionally some also have uh, requirements like they need you to do certain ultrasounds or during the birth they will actually require like a continual fetal monitoring like every 30 minutes or they just have their little bits and pieces and I really wanted a midwife and a birth worker and uh, not so much a medwife. At about 15 weeks we began learning about the concept of birth tourism so essentially there are 31 countries around the world where you can give birth, the child that you give birth to will automatically have access to citizenship of that country and then the parents get permanent residency automatically and then there's that pathway to citizenship as well. A lot of these countries are in Latin America but uh, Canada and America for example also offer it as well and I always get asked this question but yes the child also gets Australian citizenship just because um, one or both of the parents are Australian citizens as well and they're entitled to that from birth. Now a lot of people when they find out they are pregnant are inclined to move towards family and towards those support systems but as a new family ourselves and given what we've witnessed over the last three years we felt as though really important to us to begin expanding our collection of passports and you know setting up bases in multiple places around the world so you're not tied down to just one jurisdiction for your work your residency your citizenship being totally dependent on on one system if you also want to get citizenship in another country you know they often have massive barrier to entries like you can invest in a country's real estate like here in Costa Rica for $150,000 per person and that will grant you that access and that pathway or you can give birth to a child here and then you know 
can ultimately get it for free. We decided to give birth here in Costa Rica. Uh, it's a really strong passport, you know, it's a nice base. There's a really beautiful birthing community. They have no military. As these exploitive monetary systems come crashing down beyond us, we think it's really interesting to be in a place as well that is really supportive of Bitcoin. My partner and I also run a Bitcoin business and we have a newsletter. So if you guys want to subscribe to that, I will leave the links and how to do so in the description. But we also did the research looking into other jurisdictions like Mexico, Panama, El Salvador, Brazil, and a few others. Yeah, we, we felt like it was a strong choice for us as a family. When we were in Australia, hello. Mm, nice little day nap. We ended up connecting with a midwife here in Costa Rica and we jumped on a Zoom call with her. And from the moment we spoke, I just knew that things felt right. What I wanted for my birth was something that she could really support. I entertained the idea of free birthing, but ultimately, you know, women have been witnessing each other's births for forever. I didn't necessarily want to do things alone. I just wanted to find care providers and people who could hold the space and support me and really put my needs and my bodily autonomy and not be bound to any outdated uh, concepts or routines. I visited a few care providers in Australia and there was a lot of fear mongering around home births and I really believe that birth is safest where the mother feels most comfortable and safest and for me that was with someone who was medically trained in the comfort of my own home who also could be as hands off as I wanted and just let me go through that process and support the hormones that make birth, you know, a, an enjoyable and a natural experience. So I met my beautiful midwife, Jamie, via Zoom and she was just the most amazing midwife to work with and, and I really consider her a good friend of mine and someone who shared such an intimate moment in my life. and. So that was obviously very important to us, as well as finding a location for the home birth. We found this place through a telegram group and the lady who owns it, Boris, she's also a beautiful friend of mine. She is a doula and she was so, so happy to have a birth happen here on her farm. And that was really important to me, finding a space where the birth could be welcomed and I'm not finding somewhere on Airbnb and, and trying to like hide the fact that I was, you know, gonna give birth there and, and all of these things. Things. So, so working out those two things before we moved over here was super, super important for us. So at 18 weeks pregnant, we flew or we tried to fly from Australia to Costa Rica, but we didn't realize that they still had uh, vaccine mandates. So the flights that we booked initially had a one hour layover in the States and then was going to go to Costa Rica. When we arrived at the airport in Brisbane, they basically said, you know, do you have your vaccine? passports and papers. We just overlooked that. Some sources online said that you didn't need it for just layovers, but once we got to the airport, because we booked flights so last minute, they said, yeah, you guys aren't allowed to, to, to come on the plane. We were turned away at the airport, and then we had like a week and a half to reassess how we were gonna get to Costa Rica and how we were going to, to do this. So we ended up booking flights from Brisbane to Dubai. Hello to Madrid and then finally to Costa Rica. So we did a full global trip to avoid the USA. It felt amazing to finally arrive in Costa Rica a couple of weeks later, you know, in my third trimester. So I could really just like relax and surrender and build a space and, and go through this initiation like that. I had a really, really smooth pregnancy and I think that's because of all the preconception preparation that I did. I had a little bit of nausea in first trimester, but that is basically it. Second trimester was, was amazing, you know. I really, really genuinely enjoyed being pregnant. And same with third, third trimester, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't until like three weeks before I gave birth that I started feeling very uncomfortable, painting a lot of water and just like swelling. <laughs> just feeling large and very pregnant which is fine. It was nice to you know, use that as an opportunity to slow down and to turn in. Uh, I was taking a prenatal, uh, an organic one that I got from uh, like a little health food shop in Australia. And then I was taking beef liver supplements and then also vitamin C. I was getting in my daily sunlight, doing a little bit of movement and just generally being out in nature.
quite a bit. I also ended up getting three ultrasounds. For my future pregnancies, I probably wouldn't, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be doing that again. So I got my first one at nine weeks because I was like, you know, really uninformed and thought, you know, uh, I'm pregnant, what do I do? So I went to the doctors and they were like, oh yeah, you know, ultrasound. And then it told me my uh, estimated due date. And then I ended up getting another ultrasound at 20 weeks because the midwife here in Costa Rica required it just to make sure that everything was growing and functioning properly and and within this time I had no doubt in my mind that everything was fine and healthy and intuitively I felt like my pregnancy was very normal and then <laughs> because we did a home birth we actually needed a doctor to sign all of our paperwork and in order for him to do that he wanted an ultrasound and he wanted to see the baby. They were all very short ultrasounds, but yeah, I did end up getting three. When I first found out that I was pregnant, I really had no idea about birth. And my ideas of birth had come from different propaganda and movies and media and from the women in my life who maybe didn't have such positive experiences. And I had all of these subconscious fears, like what if the cord is wrapped around its neck? C-sections are so common in this side of the world. Silly things like, you know, breastfeeding is going to be the most painful thing in the world. Slowly and with enough time, I really undressed and unpacked these fears. So, you know, it's actually quite normal for the cord to be wrapped around its neck and, and until that baby takes its first breath, you know, they are receiving oxygen from, from the placenta. I watched a documentary called The Business of Being Born and with other research and with other sources realized that it was actually the cascade of interventions that ultimately bring up this like C-section rate way, way higher than it needs to be. Like I think the WHO, not that I listen to them for many things, I recommend that the C-section rate globally should be around 10% and you know there's places in, around the world like in Brazil where it's like 70% cesarean rate and some of this is elective and, and in the US and in Australia it's also high between 30 to 50% um, depending on where you're at and I'll just take another note that, that these hospitals and these doctors are financially incentivized to go through that cesarean section process and, and there is like a natural physiological hormonal process of birth and when you can leave <laughs> the women and their bodies to do what they need to do and provide a, an environment of safety and comfort then it can really support this natural beautiful process and then I'll just mention on breastfeeding that oh my gosh if it was the most painful thing in the world you know we really wouldn't have evolved to this point have very very tough nipples if that needed to be um that was a fear that i released <laughs> and i'm so happy that i did all of that preparation and that i did focus on birth for that long because i really entered the space coming from a really really empowered position and looking forward to birthing my child and and I'm just so happy now that I'm on the other side a week and a half later and and just so in love with this this sweet boy and with my family and with this life that we created and 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 with myself and what we've done and and just riding such a, a high and riding the love but yeah I'll end this video there so that's all the preconception and the pregnancy stuff and then in the next video I will go into my labor and my birth story. And it wasn't the birth that I thought that I would have at all, but it was a birth that I really, really needed and the birth that brought things to surface that have really helped me um, learn more about myself. So thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll join you in the next one.